now. Even better. Um, the, the original title for this talk, and actually the, the title I was asked to speak on, was um, When is Neurosurgery the Answer? And uh, just after saying yes, agreeing to do the talk, I was hit with the realisation that I'm not a neurosurgeon. And um, I'm actually an anaesthetist, work mainly in intensive care. And for an anaesthetist to turn up to an emergency medicine conference pretending to be a neurosurgeon <laughs> would be like if you went to med school where I did a Nottingham Forest fan turning up at Derby County dressed as a referee. It's not going to make me more popular. You're not going to believe anything I say anyway and if and when I'm found out I might not get home in one piece. So I've subtly twisted the question slightly. Um, my disclosures are, you're probably going to get more questions than answers. The answers I do get, you might not help you very much. And uh, at the end of the talk, you may be slightly more confused than you were in the beginning. This is Sara. She's 22 years old. She's involved in a road accident. Car left the road, rolled. She wasn't wearing a seat belt, so she was thrown out. When the ambulance arrived, she was GCS3 at the scene non-reactive pupils bilaterally. She was intubated, intubated, the one word I can't say, isn't it? She was intubated and brought to your trauma centre where she was still GCS3, still bilaterally non-reactive pupils. The initial trauma workup showed this, a left-sided parietal subdural hematoma, 12 millimetres of midline shift, uncle herniation, early signs of diffuse axonal injury, uh, she also had not pictured a uh, atlanto occipital dislocation, prevertebral swelling down to C4, facial fractures, limb fractures, bilateral rib fractures, left-sided hemoneumothorax, and she was positive for alcohol and marijuana. Just for a moment, I just want you to imagine that you've got, sorry, we've just come back from CT, someone's off in the corner calling the neurosurgeons. Just have a little think. What do you want to know? Some people will really want to know what her microdialysis lactate pyruvate ratio is. Some other people will really want to know the latest state of the evidence about whether mannitol or hypotonic saline is best for osmotherapy, bringing down her acute ICP elevation. And some other people will want to know where they're going to put her craniotomy incision and how to make the, uh, well, where to drill. But actually what Sarah's, Sarah's family wants to know, what you want to know, and actually what the neurosurgeon on the other end of the phone wants to know right now is what's the prognosis? How's it going to go? And why do we want to know that right now? Head injury is, the, uh, the brain is the only injurable organ where even slight mild injuries can fundamentally change who you are. And the problem with brain injury is that it's not a matter of life or death, is it? It's actually much more important. There's a big grey zone. And the thing you don't want to have is a survivor with an unacceptably severe disability. What, when you think about unacceptably severe disabilities and you think about how you're going to know if they're going to have that, then you're standing in the recess bay, you need to think first about how do we actually measure outcome in traumatic brain injury at all? Back in the 70s, they came up with this. The Glasgow outcome scale. Glasgow was the place to be in the 70s if you're into neurosurgery and finding new things. The initial scale was five points. They split it up to eight points. This is what all the traumatic brain injury studies and everything we know about traumatic brain injury uses these as measures of outcome. And it's normally split like this. Dichotomized into favorable outcome an unfavourable outcome. And for me, it's somewhat difficult to believe that all of the million people who can in injure their brains and all the different types of brain injury can be neatly split into eight categories or actually just split into two categories. And this, some of the criticism is that it misses subtle differences and subtle levels of function. Um, and in fact, if you're supposed to be an eight, then a seven is probably an unfavourable outcome. And if, if the only thing open to you is three or below, maybe, and this is what we think about, maybe, just maybe, that survival is the unfavourable outcome and death is the favourable outcome. 
And the, the reason that we're so into this and we have to stand there and decide in the beginning what's the prognosis is that, of course, the first decision you're not going to make is not about microdialysis, choice of drill, whether you're going to choose mannitol or hypertonic saline. The first thing you have to decide when you meet a head injured patient, a severely brain injured patient, is do you engage, do you retreat? Is this patient going to get all guns blazing, aggressive, resuscitative, surgical treatment, or is the injury so severe you're going to palliate? If you're 22 years old, the decision's quite clear cut. If you're 60, 70, 80, it becomes less so. So when you look into the future, the, the way that you find out about the future, of course, is looking into the past. And these are the two biggest analyses of outcome in brain injury. Um, and they are based on huge data sets. They are the, Im the impact data set and the crash data set. These are retrospectively analysed data. There's about 8,500 patients in the impact group and 6,500 in the crash group. 11 different studies in the impact group, which makes it a little bit of a mishmash of different types of head injuries. The crash patients were all collected for the corticosteroids in brain injury studies. So these are huge data sets. And what they did is they looked through and tried to identify what factors lead to what outcomes. And these, these calculators are freely, you can Google these and you can use these. And I'd encourage you next time you get a brain injured patient, put the numbers into these calculators. And I think the thing that strikes me most often is how much better the predicted outcomes, and this gives you a predicted outcome at six months and the predicted risk of death. And I always think these numbers are quite a lot lower than what you initially just spontaneously think when you see the patient in the recess bay. And they're a little bit different, but they're more or less based on the same demographics, clinical features and radiological features. So we'll go through a few of them. There's nothing, mo nothing particularly advanced about the things. There's nothing that surprising. The GCS, is lower GCS correlated to worse outcome. That's it, I'm finished, no. Uh, the GCS is, comes from the 70s, from Glasgow, of course. And if you have a low GCS, you're going to have a worse outcome. I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence by telling them the GCS, but if it's difficult to remember, good news. The motor score of the GCS is just as good. That's all you need, and it's very similar to the RLS. The problem with the GCS is there are lots of ways to mess up the GCS. The easiest way to mess up your GCS is just not to do it at all. You get so excited with all the intubating going on that when the neurosurgeon comes down and says, what was the GCS? You say, I don't know. I didn't look. A little bit easier still is just to make it up. And uh, I used to work in England as a senior house officer, which isn't senior in any way. It's some kind of slave with full medical registration. And I used, did a job for a neurosurgeon who'd done some of his training in Glasgow. And if anybody presenting a case to this bloke started their GCS with the word about, the rest of us were looking for things to hide behind. But he had a point. And about GCS is a made up GCS. The best thing to do is just to describe what the patient is doing, exactly what they're doing. Even if you do the GCS properly, you can, you can just be confused by things. If they're fitting, they're going to have a low GCS. If they've just fitted, they're going to have a low GCS. If they're in shock, then they're going to have a low GCS. For this to be a reliable outcome predictor, a really reliable outcome predictor, you need to be after proper resuscitation, whatever that means. Um, we also have a str slightly strange habit. The GCS can be adversely low because of drugs. Our drugs don't come up to the unit and apply a, a painful stimulus to somebody who's got propofol running. There are a lot of patients in the operating department lying there, not reacting to painful stimuli because of the drugs they're given. And this is a bit of a, this happens. The neurosurgeon, I, this <laughs> had one rule, no neurosurgeon bashing, but people do do it. And a GCS taken under propofol sedation is not a GCS. And in fact, the SOFA score, which is used for a lot of intensive care research, people have started to just take the GCS out because it's just recorded just wrong. And um, there's another strange thing that we do is we write one if you're intubated. But a study, I think in 2007, they looked at, if you had a real GCS of three to five, a real GCS, then your likelihood of an unfavourable outcome was over 80%. But if you had a GCS of 3 to 5 and you got a V1 because you were intubated, 
you were down in the 60s. So if we measure the GCS, you can get people who are four, six, one, and they're sitting up in the ICU watching TV. Pupils, as I say, there's nothing uh, particularly new about the things which are prognostic ind indicators for uh, brain injury. This isn't rocket science, it's just neurosurgery. Pupils, if you've got unreacted pupils, bad outcome, pretty obvious. Also, the other things that you need to think about is that direct trauma to the eye, uh, direct trauma to the optic nerve, glass eyes. We had a patient in the CT scanner who was uh, unconscious after a big brain bleed with unresponsive pupils. His medical records were blank. And then I opened up the other hospital's medical records. Everyone had just got themselves into a palaver at that time with whose journals you were allowed to open, whose you weren't. Some of you may recognise that sort of feeling. And I opened up and there was pages from the eye clinic about his bilaterally non-reactive pupils. I don't actually remember why, but the GCS, the, not the GCS, sorry, the pupillary reaction is a, a reliable prognostic indicator. This is why the surgeons normally ask for it, the neurosurgeons, but only if it's done properly and only if it is actually true. Age, very quickly. Age is relative in intensive care medicine. There's people being admitted to the ICU now who would never have been admitted 20 years ago. But age is an important, important prognostic factor for TBI. And it's not just to do with the, the fact that you get more subdurals or you get more intracerebral bleeds or you get more complications. If this is a, a graph of pinch from a colleague, a Karolinska, if you're 80 and you have a moderate to severe TBI, you've already got a 60% chance of a bad, bad outcome just for being 80, even if you sort away everything else. CT scans, also no big surprise. How bad your CT scan is is going to affect your prognosis. But what is it about the CT scan specifically? Both of these prognostic models use features of the CT scan. There's a couple of scoring systems, the Marshall scoring system, the Rotterdam scoring system. But essentially what they're looking at is signs of compression and intracranial bleeds. And work done also from my unit. None of this work is me, it's with my incredibly good colleagues, but... Actually, more information might not be better if you just look at midline shift, and not just if you've got it or not, but how much you've got, and then compression of the basal systems. Those two things are just as valuable as everything else. If you have an extradural hematoma, it's actually a mitigating factor against the other signs of the, or the, on the CT scan. It's a good prognostic sign if your signs come from an extradural hematoma. Secondary injury. Now we're coming to the intensive care department. This is stuff that I actually can. This has nothing to do with drills or microscopes. The thing about secondary injury and traumatic brain injury is that none of the other things we've talked about we can do anything about. It's, everything's out of our control apart from this. Does anyone know where this picture's from, by the way? I just thought it'd be obvious. No one seems to know. This is a picture from Hot Shots. And while they're discussing where their bag is, his head's being repeatedly closed in the doors. And this was a guy who ejected from his plane, was completely fine, and then eventually died because his head had been bashed into every door on the way in. This isn't really secondary injury, but these factors, a single episode of hypotension under 90 systolic can double your mortality. And it's not just that this is a, an expression of a more severe injury. Iatrogenic hypotension, increased mortality. If you reverse it, you're going to get a better result. No speaker on traumatic brain injury who works in Karolinska can get out of there without talking about biomarkers. The S100B has got a lot of attention, especially the emergency department, as a rule out for minor head injury. Lots of the work's been done at Karolinska. What it is, it's, a, it's a, an astrocyte protein uh, involved in calcium metabolism, but it's released from brain cells when they get injured after about 15 seconds. She's got a short half-life, uh, and people have thought, Maybe we can use that as a marker for injury. The problem with S100 is that it's also released from fat. It's also released from muscle. And unfortunately, in the recess bay, your S100, although it's a good rule out, it's a useless rule in. Almost all of our major trauma patients have a sky high S100. But that extra cranial bit falls away really, really quickly. And between about 12 and 48 hours, the work that they've done on S100 with prognostication has found that if you've got an elevated cerebral S100, it actually performs better than all of the other factors, age, pupils, GCS. And then we also use it as screening for potential secondary injuries. Small uh, later increases in S100 uh, are a good indicator of that something new has happened. And here we come down to it. There's a kind of pervading nihilism with brain injuries. 
We get it with our junior uh, residents when they come to the neuro ICU. It's very depressing. The problem is the self-fulfilling prophecy. These prognostic models are great. They're the best thing we've got. They talk about populations. They don't tell you about the patient you've got in front of you. And the fear with prognostication is, can your prognostication affect the prognosis? It's pure maths. If you have a patient with a 95% mortality and you withdraw life-sustaining treatment, you override all the other prognostic indicators and you convert your 95% mortality to 100% mortality. And the problem is that you don't know that you've done it. You have no way of knowing if you were right or wrong. In fact, you think you were right because you were proved right. If you don't buy a lottery ticket, you won't win. It doesn't mean that you were right about the fact that you weren't going to win. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of self-confirming futility. Come back to Sara. Sara is a real case. It's not my case. It's borrowed from a published article. I've put the whole case up here because this exact case vignette, among some others, was given to a bunch of different doctors of different seniorities, different specialties, neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, intensivists, emergency physicians, and something else. I can't remember. And what they were asked is they were asked a couple of questions. What do you think the outcome is going to be? And what do you think the treatment course should be. And I've cheated a bit. I've given her a face and a name, humanised her slightly. But if you think about it, they're getting a short history and a CT scan, just as the neurosurgeon is going to get on the phone, just as your consultant at home is going gonna, is gonna to get on the phone if you're a junior. And quite surprisingly, 18% of the doctors they asked recommended withdrawal of care based on that admission information alone. And 50% of the neurosurgeons. Now, this for me is quite extreme, 22 years old, I think in reality, I don't think anyone in this room probably would, would, would recommend that in reality. But this is the same in, in repeated studies that surgical specialties have a higher level of, of drawing a line. And whether this is that they see the, compl the complications, whether they get the patients coming back for shunts to their clinic a year and a half later, I don't know. But if you put her numbers into the, the impact and the crash calculators, you get slightly, firstly, you get slightly different numbers, which I think is to do with the, there's more information on the CT scan and the crash calculator. But they're not 100, are they? It's undeniably a very, very severe injury, but they're not 100. And in actual fact, six months later, this is what it says in the, in the, in the, in the paper, six months later, she's communicating, walking, going to outpatient, physio, outpatient physiotherapy, and is still improving. This is a scary case. Right? I think everyone... It's probably had a case where you withdrew life sustaining treatment and you hoped it was right. And the scary thing is, is if any of these doctors had been looking after Sarah, they could have feasibly got a thank you letter from the family for their excellent care. And you'd never have known. So self-confirming prophecies are a big risk. So early prognostication in TBI, who to treat, who not to treat, is a really hard nut to crack. And although these prognostic models are the best things we have, you can't use them to say yes or no to the individual patient. All of the things we know, it's the simple things. Age, your GCS motor score, pupillary reactions, simple signs of compression on the CT scan. Probably S100B, it's not widely used. Beware the self-fulfilling prophecy, because it's real and it's out there. And Always get the basics right. Avoid secondary injury. It isn't rocket science. It's only neurosurgery. Thanks.